Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. My guest today is Fadi Shehade, CEO of the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, or ICANN, uh, the institution that is responsible for ensuring that those emails you send or those websites that you visit uh, end up at the proper destination. Of course, ICANN does a lot more than that, but essentially they're, they're responsible for maintaining the uh, overall framework and address system uh, of the internet. It's a, a daunting task. Many people around the world, I suspect, uh, Mr. Shahade, aren't even aware of uh, the full role that ICANN plays and how crucial ICANN is to their daily internet experience. Now, for the longest period, there has been an international debate about the need to broad base the uh, way in which ICANN is run, its oversight system. Um, the United States, which was instrumental in the creation of ICANN, had been for several years quite resistant to the idea of change. There were a couple of conferences, international conferences, where different ideas, different models were brooded around. And it seemed as if the US uh, was kind of reluctant to, to get rid of its oversight role. Things have changed pretty rapidly in the last couple of years. Yes. Would you, uh, what importance would you attach to the Snowden factor? Because in, in a lot of the uh, uh, discussions worldwide, there is a perception that Edward Snowden's revelations uh, about the way in which the US has you know, penetrated into that um, uh, sort of uh, messaging around the world uh, is something that you know, many governments have taken quite seriously. And uh, so to what extent has the US, the change of heart in America, willingness to let go uh, or to modify the existing system, been driven by this negative international perception about what Snowden has told us? Look, the US has always envisaged that at some point the role of ICANN must be independent and neutral of their unique stewardship. They've always done so. It's in the original papers of ICANN. And in fact, the plan was to let go of that unique role of the United States in our affairs in the year 2000. And then, frankly, 9-11 happened. And a lot of things kind of got held up. But the time has come now for them to let go of this. What has caused it, what has precipitated it, uh, is frankly my guess or your guess. The reality is it's always been planned. And the clincher was, in my opinion, uh, activities that started before Snowden even made his revelations. And uh, this year will uh, generate almost $4.2 trillion in the G20 economies as digital economy revenues. This is significant. And this is not a platform that any one party, whether government or company, should have a unique role in managing its affairs. So I think we're at the point where the debate had started, that it's time to fulfill the promise that America had given back in 1998, that within a few years it will let go of that unique role. And frankly, they kept a hand in ICANN for a reason. And the reason was, we need ICANN to be strong. We need this institution to be tested. Right. We need it to be accountable. We need it to be transparent. We need the world to say, it is working for us. Right. And I think we're at this point now. Uh, just so that our viewers fully understand, yes. uh, ICANN right now is subject to oversight by the Department of Commerce, the NTI, or the National Telecoms Information Administration, uh, primarily because you handle uh, the IANA, or the, which uh, actually is the uh, body of the institution which uh, settles uh, the, root, the root servers, the, the root addresses. And there is now a process of transition whereby this oversight uh, that the Commerce Department exercises will be uh, dispensed with. Correct. How is the process coming along? And doesn't this open the possibility to the fact that ICANN uh, and this crucial role that you play uh, in backstopping the Internet will be subject to no oversight? It cannot not have any serious oversight. Look, the processes by which we do our work are established, tested, and the result is in the fact that 17 years on, we've never had a nanosecond of downtime in the work we do. You've never typed www.tata.com and ended up at IBM. Right. It always works. Now, the US government served a decreasing role over the years, leading up to their current very minor role, which is to ensure then once we uh, finish our processes to add top-level domains, top-level yeah. domains, 
there is someone at the Department of Commerce who checks that we followed our process. They don't question okay. what we do. They check that we followed our process. Once they're out of the loop, I think all of us appreciate that we have two priorities. One is to make sure that oversight remains and in fact, if anything, is strengthened, but that that oversight is broad and inclusive of all the parties that have a say in how the internet functions. So this is very important. The second thing is to ensure that no other party suddenly has an opportunity to capture that process and to steer it in a way that jeopardizes the neutrality and the independence and the stability of the system we manage. So these are the two requirements. Right. And you ask me, how are we doing with filling these two requirements? Uh, we have gathered the community over the last few months in a very uh, uh, broad exercise that now includes literally over a thousand people uh, engaged all over the world. And when you say community, you, you mean people who are in the internet community? Or the, uh, yeah, the and frankly, anyone is welcome. Yes. ICANN is not a membership organization, right. nor do anything we do limit any participation. But yes, the community is the private sector, governments, civil society, technical organizations, academics, anyone with an interest in internet governance. With an interest in how we actually manage this function for right. the benefit of the globe, right. not of one country, or not of one uh, constituency, or not of one company. And that's a delicate exercise, which uh, we've been engaged in. And we believe by June this year, we will have the end of that exercise produce, hopefully, a proposal. Right. And that proposal will be then given to the US government, right. which will check it against some basic criteria they set at the outset. And these criteria say that that should have been built bottom up, should have been inclusive, which it has been so far. Secondly, that it was multi-stakeholder, i.e. governments, business, all these constituencies I mentioned have been involved. And very importantly, that whatever that mechanism is, yeah. is not a mechanism that enables one government or a group of governments or m uh, international multilateral organizations to then replace the U.S. government. Are you confident that governments around the world that uh, are worried about the way this may go have had a full opportunity for their views to be heard and taken on board in this process? Absolutely. Governments, ICANN today has a government advisory committee that includes 149 governments and uh, 32 international governmental organizations. Right. And they're all engaged. They have their people engaged right. in this process. And frankly, we're even trying to reach out to the governments who are not in our governmental advisory right. committee to make sure no one in a few months says, we did not have the opportunity. But, but how representative is ICANN's own board or its own structures? I mean, you have just four women. Representation from developing countries is marginal. Uh, don't you think that also needs to change if it really is to speak to uh, the concerns and priorities of the entire world? Today, ICANN has a board that is geographically balanced. Uh, I, by our bylaws, we have to have people from all over the world, according to the regions of the world. Having said that, I will agree with you that we need to evolve the board further so that there is strong representation from our, around the world. Right. I'll be candid with you. The fact that we do not have uh, uh, people on the board today who are living in India, from India, uh, part of the uh, India fabric, right. uh, I think uh, is, is a huge right. missed opportunity for us. Therefore, I came here today and uh, spent time with many uh, in the community to energize the process by which the Indian community participates fully in our affairs. Right. And we welcome that. Right. Um, how necessary is it, in your view, for uh, the new evolved ICANN, the new uh, set free from commerce oversight, US government oversight, to be geographically uh, and legally anchored in the, in the US? The reason I'm asking is because you you yourself said it's not wise for any one government to have uh, authority over the internet system, and ICANN. Uh, yet ICANN, as, a, as an American nonprofit registered yes. in California, uh, you are subject to American laws and regulations. Yes. Uh, uh, you are subject to U.S. sanctions. Uh, we've seen complaints from the Russian Foreign Ministry recently, the Russian Telecoms Ministry, that ICANN has acted against uh, domains registered in Crimea because you feel you're obliged to. 
because of American sanctions. Don't you think this, this affects the international credibility of an organization like ICANN and wouldn't it be wise to push for some kind of um, status, international status for ICANN like the Red Cross or other, other world bodies that are immune, that may be based in the territory of yeah. one country but are immune from its legal processes. Wouldn't that be ideal for ICANN? Um, there are two parts to your question. I'm going to break them. One part is the way we operate must serve the world and cannot be subject uh, to a system that maybe the rest of the world is, un is unable to work with. And therefore, it is very important for ICANN to function as an organization that understands its constituencies all over the world and can address their needs. So the ability, for example, if there is a contractual dispute, uh, to uh, settle that dispute in uh, an arbitration mechanism that is anywhere in the world. Yes. Uh, we now allow all of that. So it's very important to appreciate that uh, not every dispute with ICANN must be settled in a California court. Right. These things now, we, uh, we are starting to accept payments in foreign currencies. We are starting to work towards uh, signing contracts with some of our contracted parties uh, around the world. These are operational things we're doing to reduce the centrality of uh, our work with the community on a U.S. model. And that's already in motion, and the DNA of ICANN has changed. Also, by the way, our headquarters uh, have been now distributed across three hubs, Singapore, Istanbul, and Los Angeles. Uh, a couple of years ago, mm. all of our legal staff, for example, was in L.A. Mm. Now we have legal staff spread around the world, mm. so we are closer to our constituencies and understand when we draw contracts that there are uh, uh, sensitivities, uh, jurisdictions, and so on yeah. that need to be embedded in what we do. So that's part one. Part two is where our legal home is. Yes. And I think there it is very important to separate uh, the, uh, the political issue from the practical issue. The fact that our legal home is in California and will remain in California for now, frankly, f from a practical legal standpoint, does not make a big difference, especially because we can settle issues and disputes anywhere in the world. No, but if, 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 if the U.S. government says, I can, you are subject to American laws, we have sanctions against Russia or Crimea, you have to follow them and you follow them. That's so a, that creates a problem, doesn't it? We're getting also some dispensation on some of these laws. Right. Uh, so we're pushing for some of that. Uh, right. In the case, for example, we work with Iran. Right. We work with countries that... Uh, normally a U.S. corporation cannot work with because we have received dispensation for right. these things from the U.S. government. Right. So we are pushing and continuing to seek yeah. that if, and I defended, uh, as you know, some lawsuits against uh, the Iranian right. uh, country code top level domain yeah. uh, with success yes. to, to basically have ICANN play its global role even if we're based in the U.S. So this is, look, an ongoing battle. I'm, I'm not belittling right. the importance of what you said, but what we need to do is continue to raise ICANN to the level of, a, of an organization that right. serves the world equitably. Right. Before we took a break, uh, Mr. Shahade, we were discussing some of the politics of uh, the fact that ICANN is ultimately still subject to uh, U.S. laws. Uh, the U.S. may choose sometimes not to enforce those laws, and you mentioned Iran as an example. But what it does, as in the case of Crimea, this has created international misgiving. So I want to press once again uh, my question on Push, whether we need to push for ICANN to have a certain legal status not dissimilar to uh, UN bodies or international bodies that may be physically located in the territory of a particular state, yes. but because of the nature of their work and mandate, uh, they are then exempt yes. from yes. these kinds of legal regulations. Look, where, is where there something we, we, need, we need for ICANN? I, I think you are right. What we need to push for is precisely that to make sure that ICANN, whether it operates under California law or any law, is actually not uh, prevented or directed in any way to serve certain countries different than others yes. uh, because of its legal status. That's what we should push for. Uh, so for now, we are a U.S. corporation, and we have thousands of contracts right. that are signed because we manage through contracts. We're right. not a regulator. Right. So it's important we maintain the stability of that system. Having said that, where uh, there are laws where we reside that actually prevent us from doing yeah. certain things, we need to strive very hard 
to have these things adjusted so we can serve what, what happen what would happen if a US court were to strike down a policy decision that I can't take wouldn't that be a problem for you be uh, an embarrassment well the I uh, mean triple x the triple x domains are being litigated right now right but not in a US court okay. these were litigated by an international review panel okay. that is part of ICANN's processes so when that applicant was not happy with our decision right then we have a process of redress right. where they gathered an international right. uh, uh, review panel right. that w was brought from around the world and that review panel made a decision. One of the areas of controversy surrounding ICANN and, uh, you know, has to do with the uh, top level, do the commercial top, the generic top level domains, yes. the GTLDs that uh, are obviously very lucrative for, for ICANN, yes. uh, .book yes. for Amazon, .baby for Johnson & Johnson. Is there a danger in uh, but that by going down this route, you are privileging intellectual property rights over access. You're, fetid, you're, 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 you're in a way commodifying words that are, you know, that belong to everybody to use. Yeah. Uh, is I can prepare to have a second look at this whole top, you know, generic top level domains business? Look, we have been very careful in making sure that really generic words, as opposed to brands or things like that are actually being handled with care. So, but dot baby going to a company, isn't that? Absolutely, we already put a lot of limits on dot baby yeah. uh, as part of our process to ensure that dot baby does not end up hurting people who think they're in a place that is necessarily safe yeah. for yeah. baby products. So we put public interest commitments and I put them in the contracts so they're now fully enforceable by our compliance team to ensure that very generic words or words that are usually understood to be regulated, like dot dentist or things like that. This uh, is already in motion, and I'm happy to say that we've come a long way since we uh, wanted to simply release these words to where we are now. Yeah. Now, now, 2015 is crucial also because there's the WSIS plus 10 review, um, where you have countries that have other views on the how global internet governance should evolve. Uh, there is on the table the Net Mundial initiative, which uh, ICANN is a part of. Uh, so is the World Economic Forum, the WEF, and other stakeholders from around the world. Uh, tell us something about the logic of uh, the, this Net Mundial initiative, yeah. and uh, how, how, is the, how is that work proceeding? Internet governance is a very broad area of work. ICANN's responsibility is at the logical layer which is the layer that sits right above the physical networks. It is ICANN's work that makes the internet look like one internet. Now, once ICANN is done, there are other layers. There is the content layer and the social layer that are all built above what we do. In these areas, there is a need for governance to support the various coordination mechanisms that are required to ensure that uh, the way we use the internet, not the way we run it, the way we use it, are actually uh, 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 serving the, the public interest in the best possible way. And therefore, it is outside our cancer remit to get involved in these areas, yet the need is huge. So when others started coming together to say, how do we solve this, um, some uh, starting at the Net Mundial meeting in Brazil that President Rousseff convened, yes. um, from there, uh, a lot of activities, including the Net Mundial Initiative, the Internet Governance Forum, etc., have been coalescing to see how we solve those areas. How is Net Mundial going? The initiative is advancing quite well. Uh, it has a very important meeting coming up here on March 31st, where it will be a working meeting to, to put out for the community's review a terms of reference. But important stakeholders, are st Internet Society, people are staying away from this, right? Uh, initially, the Internet Society wisely was concerned whether this would replace other efforts such as the Internet Governance Forum. I think since then it's become very clear that these are very complementary mm -hmm. and therefore we're working with all the stakeholders to give uh, some comfort level as to how anything new, mm -hmm. which is always kind of uh, concerning to people who have been uh, doing this for a long time, that anything new will be complementary, will support the system, the ecosystem, rather than replace any working pieces of it. Is one of the drivers of ICANN's own decision to embrace uh, Net Mundial uh, a fear that you have uh, that if this wider issue of global policy is not handled in a particular way, 
the pressure which is building up for dealing with this question, say, through the uh, ITU, the Inter Telegraph Union, or other multilateral fora where governments are involved may become unstoppable. Is that a fear? Is that a concern? That is one concern. Yeah. So, so there is a bit this of preemption involved here? In this, yeah. uh, this is one concern. There is another concern, which is to make sure that ICANN itself does not change its remit and start expanding because people say, you're here, you're functioning, you have the machinery to do what you do, why don't you take on more remit? We don't want to do that. Uh, we sincerely believe that a highly distributed, what we call polycentric model of internet governance mm -hmm. is much healthier than a highly centralized one. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third reason is to make sure that uh, the, uh, these issues are frankly addressed using an open participatory right. broad-based mechanism. Uh, I think the UN has very, very important role to play in many areas, but the UN, at the end of the day, is a state-to-state -state environment. Do you regret it? involving the World Economic Forum, WEF, in the Net Mondial Initiative? I mean, I'm not, not that it was your choice, but you... Uh, I mean, at least in India, the WEF and the whole Davos process is associated with large corporations, fat cats, um, who are not exactly, you know, organized in a democratic fashion critics of globalization and the way in which the world is run often don't have a voice uh, at that kind of forum. So what's the guarantee that a net mundial process with WEF in a way underwriting it or driving it will be as inclusive as it needs to be? It has proven so far okay. to be rather inclusive. It's all bottom up. The terms of reference are being developed in the open by all the communities. So smaller, so smaller NGOs, uh, social movements, everybody yeah, yeah, has yeah. their say here? Yeah, and half of the Net Mundial Council is uh, civil society groups that are all engaged and very encouraged by how Net Mundial is open. Uh, I'm not here going to uh, take necessarily the role of defending the World Economic Forum, but let me just be clear. Mm -hmm. The World Economic Forum is also a constituency. Right. And excluding it does not make us inclusive either. Right. Therefore, <coughs> them having a role, so long as they do not necessarily impose any particular model, which they haven't, right. the proof is in their activity so far being open, is important. We need them involved also for another reason. The Internet is no longer a vertical sector. Mm. Yes, uh, 4.2 trillion in the digital economy, but the Internet is now a very v horizontal sector. It is affecting every industry in the world. I used the word the other day of Uberization of industries is taking place now. Every industry is feeling the disruption of the Internet and its technologies, right. and this needs to be managed and understood and shepherded. Right. Uh, the World Economic Forum has a unique role to play in bringing that dialogue across all the industries that go there. They don't have a normative capability. Right. They cannot impose any rules, but them having a dialogue is a good thing. The fact that you have the Net Mundial Initiative to begin with, in a way speaks to the need being felt around the world and by ICANN to discuss global issues at a global forum, yes. right? And to, and to try to resolve these at, at a global forum. So why have a Net Mundial Initiative with this you know, multi-stakeholder approach, um, which some may disagree or feel that it's not representative enough, when you might have had a UN-driven process? Yes. Uh, I know that it's, you know, uh, there are many governments in the world that would like to throttle the internet. Yes. But just like the UN deals with human rights globally, it deals with um, culture, deals with questions of education, deals with climate change, yes. uh, and it has a way of resolving the contradictions between different countries and producing something which the whole of humanity can embrace. Yes. Why should the internet be treated any differently from all of these other topics where the UN has competence? The, we are not asking for the Internet to be treated differently. The UN should play its part and its role uh, in the Internet as well. Uh, no one can prevent that. What we're saying, though, just as we saw in other fields, that the UN can play its role as a convener. Uh, the UN can play its role as it does with the IGF, which is an instrument also of the UN. And they play that role fantastically, and we support that. The UN can play its role to set common uh, uh, broad principles that we can all live by. We all live by many of you, the human rights principles the UN has set. That's one thing. It's another thing to use this body, which was never designed for this, mm -hmm. to actually produce practical solutions mm -hmm. 
that are specifications and policy models yeah. and so on and so forth in, an, in a space like the internet. But if, if the ITU has been doing it for spectrum and telecoms for decades without any, any real problem, uh, why couldn't it handle the technical side uh, of what ICANN does so that fears around the world are uh, allayed? So I think we and the ITU settled this already. In, in other words, the ITU has a lot of very valuable standards that help at the infrastructure level, which is the layer underneath ICANN. And the logical layer has been handled by ICANN quite successfully. And the ITU and I have been pretty clear that we respect their role we respect, they respect our role, right. and there is no need to further centralize, right. uh, because I, I do believe centralization is not necessary since this is working, right. and we have a good working relationship. Right. Now, when we go beyond my layer, so now we go from infrastructure to the logical layer to the content layer, it goes way beyond ICANN and certainly way beyond the ITU, because right. now we're getting into areas of public right. policy right. Uh, that many, many organizations including private organizations and civil society, need to be at the table to discuss, or sometimes just governments bilaterally should discuss. So pl I think it's very important to say this. This black and white multilateral versus multi-stakeholder right. is frankly a thing of the past. Right. We're now in a much more sophisticated and nuanced space okay. where we're looking at every issue and saying, how do we address this issue best? What is clear is that governments have a role. What is equally clear is that other stakeholders need to have a role. The question is, what is the issue? Where is it being solved? At the national level, at the regional level, or at the global level? How do we synchronize these levels so we don't have national laws that collide with global uh, policies? Right. You need all of that to work together. This is the new sophisticated system that I think all of us are coming together to start shaping in the year ahead. Mr. Shahadeh, thank you very much.